What I love most about Jesus is that he met people just where they were at, in a boat, at a table, on a dusty road, by a sickbed. And so that's exactly where we begin today. Jesus is sitting six feet away from you and asks, where do you find yourself this Sunday morning? Easy answer, in isolation, where do you think I am? We mutter under our breath. How do you find yourself this Sunday morning? This is not to be a Zoom response where everybody's doing well so that everybody else feels that they should be doing well. Maybe it's a question to bring to the quiet moments of your prayer, just you and the Lord. Remember Eric invited us last week? God wants to know us as much as we are desperate to know God. And the Spirit. If the Spirit moves you on this Sunday morning and asks, where would you like to be right now? If you find yourself responding at Shemanus United, maybe ask yourself why. What am I missing? Who am I missing? And where does God fit into these feelings here? Again, just you and the Lord. What's stirring inside me? What's calling me? What do I feel empty without? If ever there was a time calling for prayer, for openness to the Spirit, what's happening in our lives, it's now. Time to ask the deeper questions, to scrape away what's really essential in our lives, in our homes, in our cities, in our churches. What do we need to address, to build on? Yes, these are in between times for us, us as individuals, as a human family, as a people of faith. Do you realize we only have three days of the week? Yesterday, we find ourselves almost nostalgic remembering the good old normal days. Today, betwixt and between, irritated, isolated, vulnerable, lonely. Some days we feel all of the above and some days we're hopeful. And tomorrow, back to normal. Is that the answer? New normal? And who's going to shape it? Based on what? Believe it or not, it's a grace time, but it sure doesn't feel that way. When we feel vulnerable or empty or fearful, I don't know about you, but I fill the gaps with our old successful routines, my go-to escape behaviors, or this worked in the good old days argument. And I can hear some of you mumbling to me, get real, Lynn. All I can cope with these days is my pet, my garden, and more baking. How much bread can you bake? Now you want me to sit down with tough questions? That's why I'm turning off the news. Believe me, I'm struggling right along with you. I feel lost everywhere I turn. At times, even wondering where God is or do I have a friend. We're all caught between two worlds, the one we knew and the one that's to come, physically, emotionally, spiritually. So where do I choose to turn? Where do we choose to turn? Even when everything's stripped away and the silence says nothing, let's turn to our Lord, our God, and let's turn today to the experiences of the early believers in Acts for some experiential wisdom, some grace, some support. I've invited you to read Acts 2, 42 to 47. Take time with it. And after you've read it, What strikes you about this passage? For me, for years, I loved it. The perfect community I should imitate. And now I'm downright suspicious. Yes, it's the wonderful vision of a community, one in heart and vision, but it's kind of misleading. The church, the early church, was a work in progress, struggling to figure out who they were and what was coming next. Sound familiar? They were at times an offshoot of a parent part of tradition in Judaism. Some thought they were subversive activities, a tentative movement, people looking for change. Who knows? All we know is it was a transitional time. New practices, new beliefs, questions, sometimes causing confusion, division, and struggle. The grace of God, the faith of individuals, And the dreams of a community were slowly coming together, one step forward, two step back. Have you felt that way these days? I don't know about you, but as a member of a faith community all my life, I am relieved to know that the early church didn't have its act together any more than you and I. It was an ideal to live up to. 
in terms of community, justice, and generosity. But what was this growing out of? God, a short time ago, they were afraid. The disciples hid themselves away. They denied being followers. They were left empty. They were isolated. Where to turn and what to next? Perhaps the most important question of this whole reflection is not what happened to them, but who made the difference in their lives. Just a few weeks ago, we were in Holy Week, and human weakness was everywhere. Perhaps because of our current situation, I understand why the disciples reacted how they did. Afraid, insecure, hopeless, hard to see past the moment. Until Jesus came back into their lives, bringing peace. From Easter morning at the tomb, just hearing her name called to touching Thomas, to talking on the dusty road to Amos, to breaking bread. As Eric described in his sermon last week, their lives became a confirmation of the good news, Jesus is the Messiah, and that all who are touched by this story are now asked to live now in the presence of this Jesus. The truth is when one has met the Lord on the road or recognized him in your life, or been called by name when all seems lost, or touched by his hope, when you feel something that moves inside of you that words can't express, this is what frees us. Acts 20, 20, chapter 1. No, I've not made a typing error. You and I can choose to write the next chapter of Acts. But like the disciples and the early believers, we can only do this if we've come close enough to the Lord to be touched by him. And I mean that in the deepest sense of the word. When everything else seems empty in my life, who can I turn to? On Jesus, until Jesus comes again in our lives, bringing peace and promise. When? How have you been touched lately? Take time with it. And remember... Though the scriptures jump quickly from the end of Jesus' life, then his 40 days of appearances, then to the Spirit on Pentecost, then to the early church gatherings, nothing in our lives moves that easily or smoothly, especially if we attempt to do it on our own. So, please reread the previous sentence and tell me, where did the individual's believers find the strength to continue on, to come together, to build community, to change their ways of living and loving? The answer, the Lord never abandons us, nor did he abandon them. His final gift was giving them the power of the Spirit. Only through the Spirit can acts and everything that have sustained the early community was always found with the Spirit. They were referred to as the men and women of the way, and we're unclear where they got the name. But there was a new way emerging with the help of the Spirit. And I repeat for you and I, no different then. It was transitional time, just as it is now. They had experienced the Lord individually, but what to do next? How to discern their future? There was no new normal. How were they going to reopen shop? Without the Spirit working in their lives and their community, what might we have missed? With the Spirit, they listened, and they could learn what to do to sustain themselves in faith, how to live and share in community, how to be just and generous, how to pray so that they could put their life on the line for the other. Acts twenty twenty chapter 2. Ask yourself what you think about the Holy Spirit. Does this Spirit have any place in your life, in the life of our world today? And what about the future direction of Shemaina's church? Is the spirit just something else to be figured about? Where's that energy, that voice, that vision? Where's the passion? Are we listening and watching and paying attention to the spirit today? If so, how are you doing it? And if not, why aren't we doing it? When we come together and join forces we can give birth to the work of the Spirit in our world. So Acts twenty twenty chapter 3, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. What I love most about Jesus is that he meets us just where we're at. 
So we keep counting the days until life reopens by a sick bed in our garden, watching the news to see how the world is recovering, waiting for the day that we can gather at Shemenus once more. And so that's exactly where we are with Jesus sitting six feet away asking, I give each of you my spirit and your church my spirit, just like the first group of humble believers. I ask you to help me give birth to the work of the spirit in our world. This sermon, my friends, has no ending. Only the gift of a new beginning, ours to create, ours to offer each other, What work needs to be done now? Your homework for this week. Yes, I'm the teacher. I would invite each of you to rewrite Acts 2, verses 42 to 47 in your own words. Describe Shemanus. Describe your faith community. Describe my faith community. Put your thoughts and feelings and dreams and desires. How's the Lord at work in our community now? What's essential? What do we be called to? How do we know that the Spirit's alive and well? Why would anybody want to join our church? And just maybe when we come together again, this is the first thing that we should share with each other after the hug. As Eric said, to know that we are not simply alone, but share a reality of life experience, which others also know deeply what's fundamental to what we call fellowship. I want to share from my heart what is most personal, most puzzling, most problematic, most poignant, most important. It's our faith in our Lord, sustained by the Spirit, together in Christ. Amen.